Okay, we are ready to start. I'm Dr. Carlos Gordillo from Mendoza, Argentina. Thank you, CyberSat, for the invitation to be sharing with you this webinar regarding marginal keratitis. Well, as I was telling you before, I'm Carlos Gordillo from Argentina. I'm actually working at Saliva Institute, and we are settled in the Mendoza, Argentina, and Buenos Aires, and I'm also working in my family uh, practice in the north of the country. So just for you to know where I am right now. Uh, the objectives of this presentation is to share with you some knowledge about this disease, the marginal keratitis, and for you to understand and identify it. Uh, also the, the disease and the physiopathology, to learn how to make the differential diagnostic and also the alternatives for treatment. Uh, I have been reading all your questions and the idea was to answer all the questions that you have sent during this uh, presentation. Uh, regarding background, the marginal keratitis is an inflammatory disease of the peripheral cornea, uh, and it's usually associated with the presence of blepharal conjunctivitis. Uh, it's uh, the, to represent an inflammatory response against the staphylococcus antigens. As you know, the majority of the patients has a symptomatic staphylococcal blepharitis or conjunctivitis in association. Uh, it can be uh, asymptomatic uh, colonization of the eyelid. So this is something to be aware of from the very beginning. So it's hypothesized that the marginal keratitis is the product of an anatomical and chemical variations between the central and the peripheral cornea. So let's remember a little bit about the Staphylococcus. Uh, so it's a facultative anaerobic bacteria, uh, gram-positive catalyst produ uh, production, and uh, it's immobile and non-sporulate. So uh, regarding some epidemiology, things that we should know, because this is part of the way to understand the physiopathology and also the diagnostic for later. The Staphylococcus is the major human pathogen. Uh, the data from the United States and from Europe indicates that it's uh, the predominant cause of both cutaneous and invasive infections. And it's the leading cause of infections, morbidity and mor morbid mortality in the industrialized world. Of course, that we're talking just about the general information of the Staphylococcus. But if we talk about the, uh, how it affects our eyes, uh, it, uh, this, this bacteria can coexist with the human as a common cell. Uh, between 20 and 30% of the population uh, has colonized the mucocutaneous surface and a much more significantly higher proportion of the population uh, has been exposed to it. The isolation of the staphylococcus from the eyelids uh, of normal subjects has been previously described. And as we're going to see later, there are some patients that uh, had had the infection previously, and then the culture can be negative. So the, the acquisition of resistance against the variety of antibiotics reflect the adaptive capa capability of these bacteria that have shaped its ability to cause continually shifting patterns of the disease. And one of three people are colonized uh, with the bacteria, but not infected. So after this information, we're going to talk a little bit about the physiopathology. So it's the product of an inflammatory reaction against, against the staphylococcal antigens. The presence of uh, the bacterial antigens in the peripheral area of the cornea uh, possibly the triggers a type 3 hypersensibility reaction. What does it mean? Uh, 
in this reaction, the monocomplex are formed and, deposit and deposited in the peripheral corneal stroma. As you can see in the pictures, you have the antigen and the immunoglobulins uh, together, and the antigen's antibody complex are preformed in the circulation before their deposit is in the tissue. So what is a type three reaction, hypersensitivity? It occurs when there is accumulation of immune complex uh, antigen antibody, as you were seeing in the picture before, that have not been cleared by the immune cells, giving rise to an inflammatory response and attraction to the lycosids, as you can see in the picture. So this is the type three reaction uh, graphic where you can see the complement, the immunocomplex deposition, and the tissue basement membrane. So these reactions may progress to immune complex disease, and the complement activa activation leads to the recruitment of inflammatory cells. Uh, these cells uh, that release lysosomal enzymes uh, and free radicals at the site of the immune complex cause, cause the damage in the tissue. But it's not only the type three reaction where it's involved during the process. Uh, there are many papers regarding uh, the physiopathology of this uh, disease. The marginal keratitis has been studied for uh, many years and described in different papers the presence of uh, another kind of reaction is a type four the incidence of the marginal keratitis and the isolation of the staphyloaris from the leads were not significantly different in some studies in patients with and without in case of cell mediated immunity. This suggests that the presence of a delayed type of hypersensibility, as I was telling you before. So what is a type for uh, delay hypersensitivity? It's a reaction that takes several days to develop. It's not antibody mediated, but rather it's a type of cell mediated response, and it involves the interactions of T cells, monocytes, and macrophages. So uh, this graphic and the other one is gonna help us to understand uh, this kind of reactions, and also to understand why in some patients that we have the inflammatory reaction, we don't have a, a positive culture for the staphylococcus. Uh, this is a really clearing paper uh, regarding the role of the uh, superantigens in the pathogenesis of the marginal keratitis. The term superantigens was described as a group of molecules produced by the pathogen, the staphyl, organisms and capable of inducing activation of T cells and uh, B cells also. So the aim of this study was to establish whether uh, the superantigen producing staphylococcus are present on the eyelids, margins, and conjunctiva of these patients. So when you don't have enough uh, culture of the, uh, of the eyelid, uh, you may suggest that there are toxins in the pathogens of the marginal keratitis that has been already in contact before. So after this, we're going to talk a little bit about the symptoms. Uh, the patient can appear with pain, photophobia, foreign body sensation, uh, eye redness, blurred vision, and watery eyes. Uh, all these symptoms can be together, or you can have one or two of them. Uh, it's really important for us to think about this uh, disease and the personal and family history, and if it's the first time or not. Usually, uh, the personal history is going to show us a patient with chronic blepharitis. There are complement activation and neutrophil activation with the formation of peripheral stromal opacity, also called cataral infiltrate. This lesion may, may involve with epithelial damage forming the marginal ulcer. Here you can see the first picture uh, of 
a marginal keratitis. As you can see here, you have three different lesions in the uh, inferior part of the cornea, and then you have the uh, fluorescein tension. What's, what about the ocular examinations? So we always need to see uh, the visual acuity without correction, the visual acuity with correction, the pinhole is going to help us, Mo ocular motility, slit lamp evaluation, intraocular pleasures, the, uh, the, pu the uh, pupils, of course, and comfortable should visual fields. Why is all this information important? Because it's part of our diagnostic. Uh, you always need to take, uh, like, to think that this patient is going to come with a uh, blurry vision and in pain and photophobia. So sometimes it's difficult to evaluate, but uh, it doesn't mean that it's not really important. So maybe you need to uh, use uh, anesthetic before before uh, the evaluation. So the slit lab, uh, slit lab evaluation, I'm sorry for this. Uh, so we're going to uh, think from outside to inside. So the lid, the lashes are going to be the first thing to evaluate. And we're going to see erythematous and edematous lids, as you can see here. Blepharitis with uh, color reds. It's, you, I don't know if it's able to see in this picture. Uh, the main vomit is also going to be there. And um, agnus rosacea is often also present, but not always. So you're going to see some telangiectasis in the, in the eyelids. But please always take a look to this. Um, then you're going to understand why this is important, because you can see this for here. We're in touch with these areas and where the, uh, the cause, the principal cause of this blepharite, uh, of this reaction. Then we need to go to the conjunctiva and the sclera, where we are going to be able to see conjunctival uh, injection, as you can see here. What are the most important signs? Unilateral or bilateral peripheral curvilinear infiltrates in superficial cornea as you can see here, uh, where lead cross the corneal periphery. As I was telling you before, it's a place where uh, there's contact between the eyelids and the cornea. You have loss of corneal epithelium ulcerations in the marginal zone. That's why we call it marginal keratitis. And it's separated from the limbus by a clear corneal zone. As you can see here, the limbus is not involved a little bit area of safe cornea. And uh, usually the, the lesions are circumference, circumferential, and you have progression of association uh, of associated marginal infiltrates um, with limbal hyperemia and conjunctivitis. Uh, they also can be associated with keratitis also, which presents with small flat contact lesions on the corneal epithelium but it's not always there. So depending on the time that it's been uh, diagnosed, you can see also the infiltrates all together forming just one lesion. You have both possibilities. Here we go. So some important signs. The curvilinear infiltrates in the superficial cornea it are subepithelial and in the anterior stroma. Be aware of that. And you're going to be able to find them at 10 to 4 or 8 o'clock. Why is that? Because uh, it's, uh, there are the places where you have uh, more contact with the eyelids. Uh, ulcerations are located in the marginal zone and separated from the limbus, I was, as I was telling you before, by a clear area of cornea. Um, fluorescein stains often show epithelial defects that are smaller than the infiltrate cornea, because this is 
Sophie Petit, as I was telling you before, and then in the anterior stroma. So this can be single or multiple. The infiltrates, which subsequently can be all together or qualize with the uh, overlying the epithelial breakdown of the corneal epithelium. So here you can see another patient uh, with the lesions usually appears in areas of direct contact between the peri peripheral area and the eyelid margin. Uh, so this, this is usually the way they, they appear. As you can see here, this patient has uh, many lesions and some leucoma from previous infections. So although it's unusual, in severe cases, you can have hypopium. Uh, you may uh, think about uh, another cause that can be infectious or not. Um, this scenario is kind of scary, but you have to be aware of the history of the patient and a proper examination is going to help us to, to to diagnose if it's a case of endophthalmitis or not. Now we're going to be able to see the difference between infectious and non-infectious pathology. So I'll leave you some tips uh, or notes for the sign of the cornea that you're going to be able to read after the class. Uh, so up to here, we're going to stop for a few seconds to think about the, the marginal keratitis. And please remember, it's uh, associated with blepharitis. The marginal keratitis is a common cause of red eyes. The patient comes with uncomfortable eye, uh, often presenting bilaterally with peripheral di discrete infiltration with circumlimbal sparing. Uh, remember, the staphylococcus is involved and it's not infectious. And the results from an enhanced cell mediated immunity at the limbus to the antigens of the staphylococcus aureus and the leads. So it's important to understand why it's coming. And also think that it's inflammatory. The treatment is therefore with a combination of topical antibiotics and steroids, usually uh, results in a rapid resolution of the thing on the symptom, symptoms. Why I'm telling this? Because usually um, what we, we see with patients that are coming from some general doctors that don't want to give them steroids because they, have, they are afraid of the steroids and the infections. So this patient, if you don't treat it properly, you're going to have complications. Uh, just a breeding of the Aconcagua Mountains here in Mendoza, just for you to know where we are. And this is the highest mountain in Latin America. And we're going to advance with a question for you. Uh, so in reference to the Staphylococcus marginal keratitis, we just the following option is not correct. So I'll give you the opportunity to answer. It's an inflammatory reaction. It's a type 3 and 4 immunity process that has been described in the physiopathology. It is usually associated with a previous trauma and corneal ulcer. Usually has self-limited cores, and last topical corticosteroids are recommended as the treatment of the choice. So please give your answers. Perfectly, 69% uh, has give us the the right choice. It's usually associated with the previous trauma and corneal ulcer. No, it's not. Great, let's go on. So how we deal with the diagnostic? With all the information we have seen before, it's enough. So if you understand the, how important it is to make the interrogatory, the semiology, the clinic, and the slit lamp evaluation, it's enough to uh, understand the pathology. Uh, so it's usually based on patient history, 
and uh, the slip lab evaluation findings. Of course, you can use different uh, diagnostic help uh, alternatives, uh, but you don't need anything else. For example, if you have a, a tomography opportunity, you're going to be able to see how deep is the infiltrate in the anterior stroma or if it's epithelial, uh, subepithelial or not. But with a good sleep lab evaluation, it's enough. I'm going to show you a few cases uh, before, uh, after this. What about the laboratory biopsy? It's going to be a sterile because it's not infectious. So the ancillary testing can be useful for us, especially in atypical cases. As I was telling you before, if you have uh, hypopion and if you are not sure if it's uh, a, a, a supra infection with another German, you can be uh, help for that. But for the pure lesion, it's going to be sterile. And as I was telling you before, you can check the, the presence of the staphylococcus in the eyelid, but in some patients it's gonna be absent also. So how do we make the differential diagnosis? This is the, the, the best information we're gonna have. Other ca causes of ulceration of the peripheral corneas are gonna be microbial keratitis, contact lens association corneal infiltrates, rosacea keratitis, Murans ulcer, peripheral keratitis uh, associated with uh, arthritic uh, rheumatoid, the PUC, uh, the flictinolosis, also to range marginal degenerations and marginal her herpes simplex keratitis. So as you can see here, we have infections and not infections, but all of them are affecting the peripheral cornea. So how to distinguish if it's infected versus not infected? This is the most important thing, and this is a great paper published by some colleagues from India. Uh, they have a huge experience in infectious keratitis. All my friends from, from India, some of them are connected here, and I've learned a lot in, in Arabic regarding this infectious keratitis. So check this paper, and you'll be able to see uh, different tables. You have infected keratitis. In case of uh, those patients, you can think of bacteria, gram-positive uh, or negative, uh, fungi, the filamental, uh, mostly filament filamentous fungi, I'm sorry, uh, viral with herpes samples or, or parasites. Once you have discharged all of these, you know that you have different uh, symptomatology and way of presentations. So uh, to know, to be able to know the presentation of the not infected keratitis, you're going to be able to understand if it's a PUC, if it's a flicternal keratitis, a vernal ulcer, or if it's uh, our marginal keratitis, uh, or maybe a contact lens related sterile infiltrates. So I did this uh, table for you to see the sterile versus the infectious. What to consider in the sterile ulcer, usually it's smaller, less than one millimeter, but it, it can be confluence. Uh, usually it's less than two clock hours extension. It's more peripheral. And uh, it's, you have a minimal epithelial damage defect size compared with the underlying infiltrate. Uh, usually we, you don't have mucus discharge and it's less painful. Uh, it's, you have the patient with photophobia. That's why it's kind of difficult to get very good pictures of these patients in the very first moment. And usually you don't have anterior reaction. You have a little one. So against the infectious keratitis, uh, you, you're going to have uh, bigger lesions and usually are not uh, are more central and not that peripheral. So let's go for the, with the next questions. One of the following signs is mandatory in the uh, marginal keratitis. 
you're going to be able to answer also. It's unilateral or bilateral peripheral curvilinear infiltrates in superficial cornea where lead cross the corneal periphery. Um, it's uh, in absence of epithelial defect and subepithelial sub reaction. Anterior chamber reaction and hypopion must be there. Radial keratoneuritis, it's mandatory. And central corneal abscess is described. Let's see your answer. Perfect, 80%. Great. This is a good sign that uh, the concepts are being clear. Then we have another paper here. It was published in 2017 uh, with a group of doctors, and uh, it's also in my reference, where you can see the differential diagnostic of the peripheral ulcers and how to distinguish from one from the other. So the most important thing to know is that in the, the rest of this uh, differential diagnostic with steroid corneal ulcers, you need to be aware of the systemic area. So you need to be in contact with the rheumatologist and the clinic. And if you are under suspect of a peripheral ulcerative keratitis, uh, don't be afraid of calling our colleagues because these patients are going to need systemic treatment. Uh, in difference with the marginal keratitis, the treatment is going to be uh, responding pretty quickly in the first two, three, or five days after you give the, um, the steroids. In the most, the big difference with the other one is that are not going to be answering to the topical treatment. You're going to be uh, needing more than that. So what's the prognosis of this uh, marginal keratitis? The natural course of the disease is, is a spontaneous resolutions in two or three weeks with free to no, uh, no long-term sequelae such as anterior stromal scarring, uh, maybe some astigmatism, uh, but as it's peripheral, uh, usually it's not that big. The recurrence are common, especially in the concomitant blepharitis. If you don't treat it, you're going to have it again. And the only dangerous thing here is when you don't treat it properly, the, the, the corneal thinning, the peripheral can go and, and go and go. And maybe you can have uh, another infection with some other bacteria or a fungal keratitis in the same area. So I've seen many cases of this in different places around the world. I have been working all over, and I had the opportunity to see different reactions. And the main problem, no matter where you are, is not thinking about the staphylococcus. Because sometimes you are in some places where you don't have the resources to do the culture or to do the, the different examination. But the main problem there is not, uh, don't, it's not that you don't have the resources. The main problem is that you don't think about this. So uh, regarding the differential diagnosis of the peripheral steroid corneal ulcer, you should consider all the following options except peripheral ulcerative keratitis, marginal pellucid degeneration, murem, terrian, or herpetic keratitis. So all of them should be in our differential diagnosis except one. This is not correct. The option is B, marginal pellucid degeneration. I guess there was a mistake here, no problem. Uh, so the thing is that this is the only one that it's been described lately uh, with keratoconus, but it's not uh, with a type 3 or 4 uh, inflammatory immunomediated uh, system. So let's go to the treatment. 
The treatment of this condition focuses on addressing the two main components of the disease. So the sterile coronal inflammatory reaction with topical corticosteroids at least four times a day for one or two weeks. Uh, you can use also low dose of prednisolone 0.12 with an anti-inflammatory effect or stronger concentration 1% with an immunodepressive uh, effect. Well, so mostly you need to think about this uh, depending on how bad is the patient and how many lesions and symptomatology you have. Don't be afraid of using uh, also uh, anti-inflammatory, topical anti-inflammatory for, for the pain. The most important here is that you, if you know the diagnostic, it's gonna take a few days. Uh, in addition, you can add topical antibiotics uh, for prophylactic or therapeutic benefit, especially in cases where uh, there is epithelial breakdown, because as I was telling you before, you can have a sober infection on the epithelial breakdown. Uh, so here you have a patient on the first day after uh, she arrives, she has a lot of vessels and inflammatory uh, area and you can see here the limbus it's clear and then you have the lesions so it's important to reduce the antigenic burden by treating the bacterial lead disease so this treatment involves the usual blepharitis regimen which commonly includes warm compress and improved lead hygiene with frequent eyelid scrubs the topical and or systemic antibiotics are often at in acute presentation with the oral antibiotic that can be macrolid, acitromycin or tetracycline. So these questions were also in your, in, in one of the most uh, popular questions you made to me were uh, things about the tetracycline, the doxycycline. I really like this treatment. So the tetracyclines have been shown to decrease the lipolytic activity of the Staphylococcus, which is presumed to be one of the ways that the bacteria tears the meibomian glands and gives the chronic inflammation. So you can see here, the patient has uh, been resolving the, the inflammatory reaction and you all have a little coma there. Uh, this is really like, story case I had in, in Africa when I was in a mission over there in Congo. There was plenty of patients with pain and red eye and with le these lesions. Uh, so in this area, they, they really don't have much access to, to eye drops. And they do have access to doxycycline. So you can see here how deep has been going the, the inflammatory lesion. And you can see, I was, as I was taking these pills for the malaria and the paludism uh, prophylaxis, I was able to know that uh, it was for free in the hospitals for the patients. So you can give them this as a treatment. And you can see how it's almost sealed. Uh, I know it's, it's not gonna be enough for this patient, but uh, if you have problems with a topical treatment, you need to understand that uh, the doxycycline is gonna help you with the staphylococcus, but not with the inflammatory reaction. So uh, this is really nice to, to be aware because it's gonna inhibit the matrix metal proteinase activity in the uh, cornea and in the eyelids. Uh, what about the acetromycin? It's also good. You can use it topically or you can use it orally. Uh, orally, I'll rather prefer the doxycycline because you can give it more days. Uh, you can use it for one a day, one pill a day, 100 milligrams for 14 to 30 days. But if, if you have a patient with a good tolerance, you can, you can use it for longer. 
uh, well, there were some other questions regarding surgeries. Uh, if you can do surgeries in patients with uh, previous, uh, with previous uh, marginal keratitis, we have some papers that have been describing uh, activity after intra or intravitreal injections after uh, surgery. But the most important thing is that if you treat the blepharitis and the staphylococcus, you're not going to have a problem. So be aware of that, and you're going to be able to do any surgeries or procedures you, you need. If you have a lot of uh, leucoma lesions in the peripheral, probably it's not going to be a good idea to make a flap there because you're going to have association with an inflammatory reaction in the stroma. Uh, then there was another question between the, the interrogatory you made to me. What about the treatment uh, in children? So here we are used to treat after we teach the, the, the parents to make the, the clean of the eyelids. You can also use topical ointment of tacrolimus. It's a way of uh, having an immunomodulation of the patient uh, uh, surface. So we prepare a tacrolimus 0.1% ointment. Uh, it's very good for the patient, but it's kind of itchy. So as a conclusion, marginal keratitis may represent different clinical features uh, of the same disease process. The laboratory investigation for underlying systemic disease may be warranted in patients with the appearance of peripheral corneal disorders. Be aware of that, please. The chronic inflammatory therapy may be affected in limited uh, the progression of the corneal thinnings in this disease. So thank you very much for your attention. Another picture of Mendoza in Argentina. You're all welcome to visit us. Uh, these are my reference and my contact. We're going to see some questions that I have here. It's a uh, cataract infiltrate the same as flictal. No, it's not direct. Uh, it's not the same, but the cataract infiltrate has the same uh, immunomediate uh, response. What is the best precaution for bacteria, virus, fungus infections to the eye? Uh, uh, so, the best uh, precaution for bacteria, virus, and fungus, it's, I guess, uh, well, it's pretty different. The etiology of all of them are different, but be aware of that uh, your patient has a really clean area in the eyelids. It's a keratitis only involved in the inferior peripheral cornea. No, it's not only involved in the inferior. You can have it 360, but usually you're going to have inferior and superior if you have a contact of the eyelid with the cornea. Remember that you, you, you may have 360. Uh, okay, describe the keratitis and precautions in town lines. Uh, the precautions uh, of the, this keratitis is having a clear area of the staphylococcus. And the precaution is uh, to be aware. So once you make the diagnosis and you explain the patient how to deal with it, you're not going to have uh, more problems. Uh, let's go for another one. Um, Okay, the prescription of acitromycin and doxycycline. As I was telling you before, acitromycin, uh, you only can have 500 milligrams by day during three days. And then you have to uh, be aware of this pres prescription because you, you have to wait one week or two weeks to repeat. Uh, usually we don't, we don't use acitromycin orally because we are going to need more than three days of treatment. So that's why we use doxycycline, 100 milligrams a day during 14 to 30 days. 
as I was telling you before myself, I, I was taking this pill for three months in, in Africa as a prophylaxis of the malaria, and it was perfect for me. I didn't have any problem at all. Uh, what are the best combination of treatment of marginal keratitis? Well, as I was telling you before, Philip, uh, uh, you need to treat the inflammatory disease with steroids. That's the first line. If you only have steroids, use it. Doxycycline orally and uh, topical steroids. If you have the opportunity to add antibiotics, usually you will use moxifloxacin. Is tacrolimus indicated for all children? What tacrolimus in children? What about topical steroids? Yes, uh, you can use topical steroids uh, uh, in the moment of the reaction, but to prevent the future uh, reactions, like in chronic patients that are not responding only to steroids, you need to decrease the inflammatory reaction. Uh, as you know, in medicine, uh, Maulid Omar is your, uh, your name. As you know, in medicine, we don't say all because you need to treat every case as unique. Uh, we have the experience, a very good experience with Dacrolimus for uh, some kids that are not responding to the topical treatment and to the cleaning of the eyelids. For how long the treatment of blepharitis? Usually when, when, it's a, when, when the patient learns how to deal with that, yeah, they do it themselves. They do it themselves, and because they don't want to have the blurry eye again. Uh, do the type four immune reaction. Are they representing the same way in the peripheral cornea? Uh, it's it's interesting. Yes, it's it's pretty the same reaction, but the lesion is different. Okay, uh, contact lens and marginal keratitis. Do you advise long-term lubricant use? Yes, always. Acetromycin eye drops, do you recommend it? Uh, well, it's gonna help. Yes, and I do recommend it because it's easy for the patient to use it uh, uh, twice a day, in the morning and in the afternoon. And it's really like, the it's good, but you always need to think that this is going to be preventing the blepharitis reaction. It's not going to be useful for the activation of the immune uh, process. So uh, more about PUC. We, we need a special class for uh, PUC because it's really huge. The most important thing and concept to, to be aware of PUC is that you may have a, a treatment, you need to have a treatment with a systemic steroids. And uh, sometimes we need to, uh, to intern the patients for systemic uh, immunodepression because otherwise you're not going to have uh, a good uh, answer. So I think we are done with the time. Thank you everyone for joining us today.